Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Christy Schrillenberg. Um, I am the director for the Center for Capacity Building at the National Alliance to End Homelessness. Um, we are going to start here in about a minute or so and let people uh, get into the Zoom room. So just bear with us. You just joined us. We'll get started in about a minute. Uh, we're letting folks enter into the webinar. Folks are still joining the webinar. We're just gonna give folks another minute. Welcome everyone. We'll get started in about 30 seconds. Lots of people from all over the country in the chat. That's great. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today to uh, talk about targeting new resources for maximum impact on ending homelessness. My name is Christy Schollenberg. I'm the director for the Center for Capacity Building at the Alliance. And I just wanna welcome you all this afternoon and this morning for those of you who are joining us from the West Coast and beyond. Um, I'm gonna do a little housekeeping uh, and then we're gonna jump right in. So just to note, uh, everyone is uh, muted, uh, and so we really encourage you, as you're already doing, to use the chat box, uh, share information and ideas, and uh, take a minute to dialogue with your, your colleagues. For questions and answers, which we'll have towards the end of the webinar, uh, please use the Q&A feature. We'll be looking at those and then um, uh, bringing those questions to our panelists uh, towards the end of the webinar. This webinar is going to be recorded or is being recorded, sorry, and slides are going to be available as well as some accompanying materials. Um, I'm going to put a link uh, into the, the chat to our uh, system series page um, so that you can access the webinar recording, uh, the slides, and the um, accompanying materials that will uh, be added to the to the to this page uh, within 24 hours of the webinar. So just a quick a note um, on our system series page, we have a couple of other upcoming webinars. Our next webinar is gonna be June 16th and it's gonna focus on centering racial equity in the work to end homelessness, aligning vision with practice uh, at the systems level. And then on June 23rd, look for um, that link soon. Uh, we will have a webinar uh, focused on engaging people meaningfully in system level decision-making within, uh, within your continuum of care. So a little bit about the system series before we get started. So 
this series that we uh, kicked off a couple of weeks ago, um, we're Focus on building capacity of your homeless response system. Um, and we're doing this because we know you're working in your communities in a very challenging um, time in housing crisis and housing market, all of that coupled with the pandemic. Um, you're helping folks navigate this challenging housing market and at the same time trying to improve your homeless outcomes. We know that you are working hard and looking for resources and ways to strengthen your homeless response system and understand what uh, what practices, policies, and, and research make your system effective and efficient and uh, importantly, equitable. So um, we want to help you identify your community strengths and gaps and how best to uh, utilize uh, scarce resources, not scarce resources, but scarce resources. We'll change that uh, when we update the slides. So on to our webinar. Uh, we have got a great panel of speakers uh, today, and um, I want to take a moment to introduce Nan Roman, who is our Chief Executive Officer here at the National Alliance and she is gonna open us up. Nan? Great, thank you, Christy. Can you hear me okay? Can hear you fine. Okay, thanks. Uh, and thanks and hello to everybody who's uh, joining us today. Uh, we're really pleased to have you on the webinar about targeting new resources for maximum impact on ending homelessness. As you know, there's been a significant amount of federal stimulus and pandemic funding, quite a bit targeted to people experiencing homelessness and even more that can be used for people experiencing homelessness. And while a lot of that funding has been spent, there's still a lot of it available. The focus of our conversation today is going to be on how to use those resources that are available now as strategically as possible to reduce homelessness, something that has not necessarily been done with these resources to date due to lack of bandwidth, lack of will, or some combination of those two. Uh, but that is water under the bridge. There's still plenty of opportunity to get significant things done with these funds. And this is especially urgent as the coming year looks like it's gonna really hold some challenges for us. Uh, where do we stand now on homelessness and what does the future look like? Just briefly, nationally, homelessness looks like it's a mixed bag. Uh, the number of people in shelter went down 8% from uh, 2020 to 2021. It looks like unsheltered homelessness is up quite alarmingly in some jurisdictions, while it's decreased quite significantly in other jurisdictions. Reductions in homelessness are likely to uh, largely be due to things like the child and other tax credits, eviction moratoria, rental assistance, enhanced unemployment benefits, and other supports like that tied to the uh, pandemic and to the stimulus. But of course, many of these are going away which will likely cause an uptick in homelessness. Also, homelessness generally goes up after a recession, which we have, of course, uh, and we might expect to see homelessness increase as a result of that in the summer or the fall. Other factors are also in play, such as housing costs going up. Homelessness among older adults predicted to double by 2025 and triple by 2030. And youth and young adults being more at risk of homelessness due to their educations being interrupted by the pandemic. And I have to say too, that after the extraordinary level of federal spending over the past two years, coupled with a potential transfer of power in Congress, generous federal spending is also likely to fade. These are some of the things we see coming and this will take place in the context of rising impatience on the part of many elected leaders who are increasingly more concerned with people being out of sight than they are with people getting into housing and increasingly likely to accept criminalization as a reasonable approach to the problems of homelessness. As the solutions to homelessness are more politicized, the support for them could decrease. And finally, these issues must be faced in the context of equity race equity most prominently, but also ethnic and gender equity. The initiatives we launched to reduce homelessness must be designed and take place in the context of eliminating disparities in our system and promoting equity. Failure to use resources strategically to help those most in need will result in increased, not decreased racial and other disparities. So this is a lot of work, um, but we are at a moment a moment in which we know what needs to be done. We know what, that we need to take on the highest need people with the most serious problems first, while we have the resources to do that. 
We know that we have to stick with what works, getting people into housing as quickly as possible and connected to services in the community if they need them. We know we need to get people to pe we need to get to people faster, especially unsheltered people, in order to save their lives. We know that we have to dig deep and make an impact because the ground may not be so fertile in the future. Luckily, we have with us today some people who have been doing just that. We have Jolie Robinson, CEO of Metro Dallas Alliance, and Brooke Eddy, Vice President of Voucher Programs at the Dallas Housing Authority, to talk with us about their work on encampments. And Vicki Millette, Executive Director of the Miami-Dade Homeless Trust, who will share their strategy around older adults. But before we get to them, we'd like to welcome two folks from HUD. Danielle Bastrash is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Public Housing and Voucher Programs, and Chad Rupel is the Director of the Housing Voucher Support Division. They're going to talk to you a bit about the resources that are available and how they can be used most strategically. Danielle and Chad, we'll start with you. All right, great. Thanks, Nan. Um, can someone just give me a thumbs up or something in the chat to let me know that folks can hear me okay? Okay, excellent. Thank you. Ready to get going. So first of all, um, Chad and I are very excited to be here. I have to tell you, I have the most wonderful sense of deja vu. It has been a while. The last time I spoke at NAEH, it was to introduce the exciting new hud -Vash program. So that is how long it's been. But I am very, very excited to be back and here today with Chad to talk about the Emergency Housing Voucher Program or EHVs. Before we get started, I wanted to make a shameless plug for our dashboards. I don't know if you have seen them. We released the Housing Choice Voucher dashboard probably about a year and a half ago. It is Googleable. If you just go to Google and type in voucher dashboard, it comes up. There is a wealth of information. It is PHA specific, but you can aggregate it at various levels. It gives you a sense of utilization, reserves, per unit costs, special purpose vouchers, um, a whole mess of information and analytics for the voucher dashboard. I think a lot of you are probably are already aware of that. What you may not know though, is that a month ago, we released its sister dashboard, which is the public housing dashboard. Again, Googleable. I think I'm making that a word. Um, but if you just go in, type in public housing dashboard, again, wealth of information. It has the same look and feel of the voucher dashboard. And there are a ton of analytics all the way down to the AMP level, which is you know the project level for public housing, as well as things like occupancy rates. So I do encourage you to check both of those out. Um, okay, so that was my little PSA before we get started. Uh, as Nan noted, uh, the administration and Congress have really given us a lot of resources to help those with the greatest challenges find and retain housing. Just a reminder, the American Rescue Plan, affectionately known as ARPA, provided 21 billion in emergency rental assistance known as ERAP um, to be administered by Treasury to help with renters keep up on rent, remain in homes. There also was 10 billion for the Homeowner Assistance Fund, which did the same thing on with mortgages to help people avoid foreclosure and eviction. And then there was $5 billion under HOME, the Home Investment Partnership Program to help create housing and services for people experiencing homelessness. But here, what we'll talk about today is the $5 billion for the Emergency Housing Voucher Program, which amounted to 70,000 housing vouchers to individuals and families who are either at risk of homelessness or who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, as many of you in this, on this call know, EHV provides new flexibilities and resources to communities to help reach populations with the highest needs. And so communities can really consider various factors um, when, when designing and prioritizing their EHV program. Things like severity of service needs, um, length of homelessness, lack of alternative options, and things along those lines. The brand new piece of EHV, which I know you're aware of, is the requirement that PHAs partner with the local COCs, 
um, in order to reach those most in need. That required partnership was the brand new piece of EHV. Uh, and, you know, for the most part, it is going really well. There are certain pockets where we have had challenges, no different from when we were standing up Hudvash, and we have been trying to do really targeted technical TA for those communities where we find that there are challenges. Um, another new feature of the program, which I'm going to mention now and come back to in a minute, are the service fees which allow PHAs to pay for costs necessary to help families find and retain housing. Service fees can be used for things like landlord incentives, security deposits, utility deposits, mobility counseling, housing navigation services, placement services, and even things like furniture and household goods, which are often one of the you know, forgotten expenses um, for folks that are transitioning directly from homelessness. So we have this wide variety of uses for the service fees. I wanna talk a little bit about how EHV is going and you know, it's going very, very well when we're looking at a national scale. We stood the program up in under 60 days. The first vouchers were provided in June or July. Um, and as of today, 77% of EHVs are what we call in use. So over 22,000 households have leased, and there's 31,000 voucher holders that are currently in the process of looking for a unit or they're finalizing the leasing process. Um, in comparison to some other special purpose voucher programs in year one, this is light years ahead in terms of the stand up, the ability to get folks leased to this degree, as well as vouchers on the street. And I would like to thank everyone in this virtual room for helping to make this program stand up a success. I know that everybody here had a, a lot to do with it, and I just want to make sure that I thank you for that. Our housing authorities are issuing roughly 1,200 EHVs per week, and the time from issuance to leasing is averaging about 90 days. We do expect the program to be at 100% lease before the end of next year. And you know, many communities have really chosen to target the EHV assistance for those with the most housing needs. Um, and we know that because we have really been looking at income closely. And on average, our EHV assisted household is looking at a yearly income of around $11,350, which is almost 30% less than the typical voucher household um, coming into the program. And again, reminding folks that 75% of new voucher admissions are extremely low income, 30% or below. Um, and still, EHV, you know, is targeting that lower um, income household than your typical voucher renter. As to be expected, the larger programs did take longer to get mobilized. Um, the four biggest programs located largely in New York and LA with one fifth of the units are about 10% leased. Programs that have under 75 units are roughly half leased and programs between 500 and 1500 units are leasing at about 28%. I'd just like to mention that our partners on the panel today are considered leaders in terms of EHV utilization. Miami-Dade Housing Authority has leased over 60% of their EHVs, um, about 300 households, and Dallas has leased nearly 24% which is over a hundred households. So thank you so much, Miami, Dade and Dallas for the great work. I wanna go back to service fees for a minute uh, because we are really watching how the fees are expended. We believe that fees are really a necessary component in order to get families housed. Um, and we have provided about $245 million in fees, which works out to about 3,500 per voucher to housing authorities. Um, we don't have a lot of data on expenditures yet. It appears as though from the data we do have, about 25% of the funds go to housing search assistance, 20% for owner incentives, 
31% um, for security and utility deposits, and then the remainder is just in this other kind of a category. Um, it is critical that that service money gets spent and that we are able to track it. Um, we at HUD believe that these fees should just be part of the program. It is so, so difficult to lease a unit these days. And if you're a higher need population, that just compounds those challenges. Um, so really just wanted, if there's a takeaway from today, from our presentation, um, it is that we are really, really pushing to have expenditure of these service fees throughout the life of the program. And so let me turn it over to Chad Rupel to talk a little bit about some common EHB challenges. Chad? Thanks, Danny. Um, so first of all, I, I will acknowledge that you all, I'm sure understand the challenges to a much greater extent than we do, uh, experiencing it much of it, uh, much at, at the ground level. But um, uh, the challenges that we've seen uh, range the gamut through the whole process, right? Uh, the first challenge is the one I think we all acknowledge is that the, the need far exceeds the, um, the funding that's available, right? We know that the need is tremendous out there in communities. At the same time, rental markets are very tight. We know in certain areas, uh, people are really having a hard time using their voucher or finding vacant units, or sometimes landlords are uh, reluctant to participate in the program, right? So this is like an ongoing issue uh, for EHV in particular, also for the, the regular voucher program. We know that a lot of the um, uh, households that are assisted through EHV sometimes take a little bit longer to lease up, right? They may have higher needs. Uh, they may need more assistance. Uh, in addition, you know, there's sometimes difficulty in obtaining the paperwork or even the tracking tenants or prospective tenants as they transition through the COC process and to the PHA. And so we are aware of these challenges. I'm sure, again, you're all probably experiencing this at a much deeper level. And, um, you know, we're, we're hoping that we're going to continue providing the resources available to help you all as you try to address them. Uh, some of the things that we've done already, and hopefully you've uh, maybe taken advantage of this, is uh, HUD has done, I think, a tremendous job of uh, providing technical assistance and resources for the EHV program. Um, you know, we've had a long series of biweekly office hours. They're all recorded and available at our EHV website. And I think we dropped it in the chat already, but it's, it's hud.gov uh, backslash EHV. And uh, they've covered, in fact, a lot of the topics here. And in, in just uh, on February, we had a number of the folks from NAEH uh, on a call there to talk about, you know, thinking strategically uh, in collaboration and developing uh, EHV plans. Um, we've covered topics such as, you know, advancing equity, using waivers, uh, trying to serve recently homeless families, just, a, you know, a gamut of topics that are available there. In addition, we've been providing on-call technical assistance to housing authorities that need it uh, or uh, COCs that need it. Um, and really trying to make the, um, the information process as transparent as possible. So again, if you go to the CHV website, you can find uh, frequently asked questions, all of our recordings, as well as the latest data we have, uh, we're sharing it as, as openly and as, as transparently as possible with uh, program administrators to help them you know, hopefully overcome some of these burdens and challenges in administering the program. Um, we have been able to identify like some key successes in the program, right? And again, you can find a lot of this summarized at the EHV website. But um, one of the things that we'll continue to encourage folks is to really take advantage of the waivers of EHV. Um, I think documentation is a good example where, you know, we do have some self-certification uh, eligibility in EHV, which makes it a little bit easier to get people the help they need more quickly. Um, we're also encouraging everyone to take advantage of the higher payment standards, right? Like sometimes just that little extra bump is all it takes in order to help uh, encourage maybe uh, a, a family or a greater opportunity for families to access more units or maybe encourage a little bit more of the landlord participation. We, uh, along the lines of landlord participation, and as Danny mentioned, the service fees are really a tremendous asset here for the EHV program. It's unique for our voucher programs and we want um, COCs and housing authorities to really take advantage of this. One of the easy ways to do this or one of the ways that we've seen success is in using the service fees to really help 
create like a landlord liaison position or at least help reach out to landlords and help identify available units and streamline this process as tenants get a voucher and then they're looking for a place to live. Uh, it's very helpful to have someone available that really helps uh, coordinate that process. Um, and then, you know, obviously allowing tenants to search longer and take advantage of the maximum search time is another way to help improve their success in using these units. Um, there's been some, uh, I think, a lot of good innovation. I think the, the basic of it is just this collaboration that's being developed between COCs and PHAs that in many communities may not have necessarily been there to the same extent before. Uh, it's great to see how EH, EHV is able to promote this. Um, I think that's you know, a big testament to the program and hopefully to some sustained innovation that can come from it. Um, we've seen that uh, another good collaboration effort that uh, hopefully is coming out of EHV is just at the local level. You know, there's, uh, we've heard of uh, housing authorities and COCs uh, really partnering so that their staff understand the various processes, they understand the systems and are able to communicate and hopefully streamline and smooth out any of the barriers that may have uh, delayed implementation of the program in the past. Uh, just recently, we heard of this example. I think uh, NYCHA is doing this with um, a regular office hours time, right? So just housing authorities and COC staff able to communicate with each other, ask each other questions, and really, again, get to understand the differences in the processes uh, when it comes to implementation. Um, and then I, I just wanted to quickly note, right, that the... Um, this assistance is great. I know the topic of this overall presentation here is just all the federal assistance that's available. And I think I'd be remiss without mentioning, right, the large housing choice voucher program, which, which Danny and I also work on and the resources that are also available in that program on a sustained level to, to help target homelessness and the families that need this assistance. And so uh, hopefully EHV makes that type of collaboration easier. But um, you know, if you're interested in seeing where your community is with regard to its housing uh, choice voucher program funding and you know potential availability there, uh, that the dashboard that Danny referenced is a great resource. I mean, that's the latest information we have at HUD as well uh, in order to see where resources are at a certain community. So I encourage you to look at that. Um, and then I know you know there's a big agenda here. So just for the sake of time, I just wanted to try and maybe wrap it up with three main takeaways for you all. Uh, the first of which I know we've mentioned our dashboards a lot. Uh, I think EHV is a, an example where we really have uh, like the most transparency of any uh, HUD programs, at least that I've been familiar with, where we're providing really daily updates of you know, how housing authorities uh, are administering the vouchers, uh, where, where the issuances are, where the leasing is. And then most importantly, there's a tab there that shows where service fees are available, uh, what they're being spent on. And I would really encourage everyone to go to that site if you haven't already. It's uh, www.hud.gov backslash EHV. And there you can also find all these different webinars on how different communities are implementing their EHV program. I know there's a lot more topics coming. There's gonna be, a, uh, there's a few good discussions coming on equity and advancing equity through EHV. Uh, and I'd encourage everyone, if you haven't visited that site to like bookmark it and, and use it as a resource as you're trying to implement these programs and really make sure your community is taking advantage of it. Um, the other big takeaway, you know, again, is the service fees, just a big reminder that those are available. You know, it's a special resource that's with this program that we want communities to take advantage of. You see that it's available there, please, uh, in your community, you know, look at some of the best practices and see if that can really help get your EHV program off the ground. And then uh, not to leave it on a down note, but I, I do want to remind everyone that this program sunsets, right? Like this uh, right now, at least the, the program is set to sunset at the end of fiscal year 2023. Uh, and so it's really, I think, on all of us to make sure that the resources are at least fully utilized uh, up to that point. And then, you know, I think it is, I think Nan maybe pointed out, right? Like this, these are resources uh, that if we want to uh, have a sustained impact or hope to have them continued, it really is best to show the their use now and uh, right now this program is set to sunset um, at the end of uh, next fiscal year. So um, with that, I can turn it over to Vicki. Unless, Danny, if you had anything else to add? No. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Chad and Danielle. And now we'll turn it over to uh, Jolie M. Brooke, 
Uh, Eddie from Dallas. Hello, everyone. Great to, I can't see you, but gracefully, great to virtually be in the same space with you. My name is Jolie Angel Robinson, president and CEO here in uh, Dallas, Texas of Metro Dallas Homeless Alliance. I know I've heard a lot about um, equity and racial equity on the call beforehand, but I do want to just also lift up many of you in the community are working in cities that have been impacted um, potentially um, over the course of, of even the last couple of weeks by significant violence. And so I just want to, I would be remiss if I didn't spend just a, a minute just honoring those lives that are lost, many of you that may be working in those cities and those spaces in the midst of all that tragedy, tragedy and continue to do some, some tremendously amazing work. So, so thank you to you. I hope you are, um, to the phrase I use a lot, I hope you're taking care of yourself so that you can take care of one another. So for those cities of Buffalo and here in Texas, Uvalde um, that have been impacted. So, so just sending uh, lots of virtual love your way. Um, next slide. This is uh, kind of what we're, the, the topic of our conversation today is, is about targeting those resources, many of the resources that you just heard mentioned. So uh, I'm looking forward to also, thank you, Brooke, for joining us from the Dallas Housing Authority. Um, and thank you for the tremendous work that you do as a community partner in this space to really focus on our individuals that are experiencing homelessness. So thank you. Next slide. Um, perhaps over the, the to dig a little deeper over the span of the last couple of years, our system has gone through tremendous amounts of change. That change has, has really called us as a lead agency to step up in a space and step up in a way um, that comes to even a reorg, uh, really outlining and filling out um, our some of our, our verticals within our organization, but also within our system as a whole, really, um, leaning into what our system-wide goals look like. And so you see those there at the, at the top, those three, effectively ending veteran homelessness, a significant reduction in chronic unsheltered homelessness and a significant reduction in family and youth homelessness. So all um, entities within this space kind of coming together as collaborators and a collective impact focus to ensure that to, to reach those goals, we're really looking at um, a total transformation of our system, leveraging the strengths of, of what the system was already doing to then uh, kind of catapult us forward in, in some of the work that, that is yet to be done and, and really tackle those, those current major initiatives that we have below. At the bottom, you'll see some of the kind of areas, the main areas of transformation that have taken place um, within our system, and and you know still finding our footing in some of those spaces as well. So, so I can't um, say enough amazing things about the strategies that have been deployed, uh, really to get us to to where we should be and want to be, and continue to get us to house effectively, um, effectively house people, um, especially those with the greatest need, as as you've heard mentioned before. That coordinated governance structure um, helped to uh, strive strategy around investments and action um, using data, uh, data, data, data. I'll say it three times, but being data informed, um, you know, about the decisions being made, about the performance happening within our system, tracking progress, reporting out on that progress as well. Um, that use of data also allows us, again, I'm gonna use that, you know, racial equity lens to have a lens towards um, racial equity when we're seeing any disparities that are showing up uh, within our system along the, the lines of race. Um, those major uh, enhancements to the rehousing system, building out that entire team for building relationships with landlords, building a portfolio of housing units, really uh, testing out uh, what does uh, you know effective landlord incentives look like to get landlords to a yes? As I've seen people lift up in the chat, you know some of the difficulties we have around engaging some of the landlords. Really having a team that's here in our lead agency uh, that's been stood up that focuses on that day in and day out for the entirety of our system, and then just a total alignment of resources. Again, as I mentioned, for those um, major initiatives you see there at the bottom. Next slide. 
um, the transformation is 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 possible, but it can it can be fueled and has been fueled by the unprecedented you know amount of dollars that, that have come into this space over the, the span of the last couple of years. And so that helped us as as we came alongside community partners in this space to talk about what does it look like for us to really dig in deep um, in the issue of um, effectively serving those experiencing homelessness. And a part of that was standardizing program models uh, based on national best practices and proven solutions, you know, co-creating a rapid rehousing model. And um, as was mentioned through that large influx of, of funding that we received. Through that, the Dallas Real-Time Rapid Rehousing Initiative the REAL is an acronym um, through our City of Dallas partnerships that they use. Um, it's like realistic, equitable is the E. Um, I, it escapes me what the A and the L mean right now, but it's really an acronym in which the City of Dallas uh, kind of uses some of the uh, lens of the work that they do to kind of filter the work through. Uh, legitimate, I know, is the L for sure. So you'll see kind of how the funding lined up for the city of Dallas, Dallas County, our Dallas Housing Authority, Brooke, um, you'll hear her speak here in a little bit. Some of our other cities, uh, three or four of our surrounding cities and the EHVs that they put into the mix. And then the, the 10 million from our private sector, our, our private found, our MDHA board really worked hard to raise um, that money from the private sector so that we can be more nimble in what the usage of that money um, can go towards, and all with the goal of rehousing over 2,700 people in, over households, excuse me, over two years. And so that's a focus on uh, 2,500 unsheltered and singles. And then you see there at the bottom 200 survivors of domestic violence and um, our families that are experiencing homelessness. We, uh, MDHA does serve as the uh, sole source contract with the city of Dallas. And so an opportunity to be the financial intermediary for those private and public dollars through that contract. Um, so that money can go directly to service providers as they're providing case management and housing navigation services. The Dallas Housing Authority has their own sole source contract. Um, that they have with the city of Dallas for administering rents and for EHVs. Next slide. This slide talks about the breakdown of how the funds are being utilized. You'll see the rental subsidy there um, for 42 million, the services being offered a part of that case management and housing navigation. And then I mentioned the 10 million private philanthropic dollars that were raised to help um, fill the gap when it comes to uh, landlord incentives, moving kits, admin capacity. So really a, a robust way to leverage those dollars that were coming in, coupled with the private philanthropic dollars as well um, for Dallas real-time rapid rehousing so that we can have um, this work, again, that, that reaches over 2,700 households by the end of, of 2023. Those interventions you see from that um, that are happening through Dallas real-time are the EHVs, uh, the voucher plus 24 months of case management, uh, for people with a disabling condition and then rapid rehousing. I think a lot of questions we, um, a lot of questions I perhaps feel through Dallas Real Time is, you know, how, what does case management look like? Um, are people receiving case management? Not necessarily, thank you, Patrick. Pa Patrick has it. Patrick gave me the R-E-A and the L. Accountable was the word I, I couldn't figure out. Um, a lot of people are wondering if case management is happening, usually external stakeholders, but yes, yes, case management is a part of um, part of the package. Next slide. Um, our organization, similar to, to many of you out there as lead agencies, we're providing that backbone, but backbone support um, as a lead agency to support the entirety of our um, homeless response system up to um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read, the, I'm not gonna to try to read the chat at the same time and try to answer, but um, I'm sure someone, Sarah might be on that she can start responding to some of those in the chat. I don't wanna uh, miss your question as it's going by. But as a backbone support to the homeless response system, Again, I, you heard me mention the housing location team. I mean, daily huddles. Um, I've coined a new term for the team called our unit 
Wranglers, right? Since we're in Texas, I have to get a little um, cowboy, cowgirl with us, um, known as the unit Wranglers. So how are we um, developing strategies? How are we testing out strategies? And in, in what we are seeing is a tough market here locally in Dallas and Collin County. Um, we've heard that from our providers as we're listening to our providers um, when, as we bef even before Dallas Real Time and as Dallas Real Time was rolling out that, you know, although they've had the capacity, you know, to do kind of onesie twosies with with unit acquisition, really having a team and it's four individuals on that team that that focus on on getting um, acquiring units every day and not just acquiring units, but also maintaining uh, relationships with our landlords if if and when necessary, um, once we get an individual housed, because we want them to, you know, continue to be perhaps a, a a partner with us as we as we move forward. We don't lose that partnership. Um, so the you'll also see the the uh, hot flex fund there on the screen. It targets the the use of the private funds help fill the gaps in resources like the move in kits, um, security and utility deposit, application fees, anything that's directly uh, related to someone being able to obtain permanent housing. And again, you heard we mentioned the. Um, the uh, landlord incentives that, that are helping us, whether it's contract to hold units, um, we're, we're really testing out all the strategies. Next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, encampment decommissioning. This is one of the ways we are really focusing on um, perhaps the hardest to house individuals. And so through a four to six week process, you know, we're really leveraging the partnerships that you see at the bottom to lean fully into um, an encampment decommissioning process that you'll see outlined there on the screen. Um, thank you, Christy. You know, I made that up, unit wranglers. But, uh, you know, Tremendous opportunity to continue the collective impact model, utilizing our street outreach um, service providers, case management service providers, all the way to you know our unit um, acquisition team being able to find units as, and taking into account you know individual specific barriers that they may have, understanding what those barriers are as they're moving forward to get individuals housed and find those units, and then working with um, our public safety partners when it comes to. Um, we kind of changed terminology, but just maintenance of the, you know, instead of enforcement, but maintenance of the encampment closure, really doing it in a way that is not punitive, but really um, is closing an encampment with a focus on rehousing. Next slide. It's a little bit of a different model than um, you know has has been previously done here in this region, and so you know we're working together when it comes to project management alongside our city of Dallas partners. So far, here's the results that we've seen, and we've really been in this really focused way of doing in Cam and decommissioning um, since about September of last year, um, taking into account um, you know the winter storm and <laughs> COVID as well have, has impacted that, but I'm. I mean, I just can't say enough about the tremendous work of our outreach workers, housing providers, the housing authority, um, code compliance has been in there, the public health we've, we've relied on as well, our mental health system we've relied on. Um, and you see those numbers there, 103 individuals engaged, 92 individuals moved in or on a pathway to housing, phenomenal. When we hear from um, some of our street outreach workers, they're invigorated and, and really feeling motivated because this is kind of the first time in their um, in the span of several years that they've actually seen folks that they've worked with for years get, get housed. And so it is pumping new energy into our system. And you see there the keys, uh, the key success factors for us that that cross system partnership, um, active engagement and outreach, coordinated, dedicated, and responsive free housing system, housing unit location, and then the cl closure maintenance. Um, next, I'm going to have Brooke, our um, Dallas Housing Authority partner, uh, to talk a couple of the next slides through. Next slide. Thank you, Julie. And I know we don't have a ton of time, so I'll try to. Um, be as, as brief as possible, but give a, a pretty good picture of what we've been doing in Dallas. Uh, before I get started, though, I do want to put in another shameless plug on behalf of HUD. Um, to say that I'm obsessed is probably an understatement with the dashboards. Um, I find a way to bring it up in every meeting and conversation and share my screen. So thank you very much to HUD for providing the very helpful dashboards for both the voucher program and EHV. So 
hopefully you appreciate that plug. I use it every single day. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, you know, we are calling our, we're like the, we feel like the public housing and voucher nerds, but like, we're very proud of it. So we're happy to have you. In the okay. Group. Well, just know that you have your number one um, fan over here in Dallas. Um, so I'll try to be, I'll try to be somewhat brief because I know I don't, we don't have a lot of time left in our section. As you can see on the screen, I'm just going to go over our overall process and explain what we've done in Dallas to expedite the homeless process. And I will just say that, um, you know, some of this is something that we were already working on at the Housing Authority to invest in technology. What we are hearing from the private market is that, um, you know, the processes need to be improved in order for them to be incentivized to accept vouchers. And in looking at the chat, there was a lot of conversation about um, the challenge of getting landlords to accept vouchers and looking at source of income discrimination and all those things. And so what we did is, obviously, we're not going to solve the problem of like NIMBYism or um, some of the reasons that they don't want to say uh, as to why vouchers won't be accepted. So we've taken the approach about what can we change and what can we do. And so that's exactly what we've done with the use of technology. And so in partnership with our continuum of care, we automated the pre-application for all of our emergency housing uh, uh, families. So as the referrals are coming in through the coordinated access system, it, get, it gets entered directly uh, by the COC for DHA to review, um, do a, a pre-review to initiate the application, which is also online. Um, and I will say this, because I know I don't have a lot of time. The really exciting thing is that when, we're, when we've been doing uh, the working with the encampments and decommissioning, a lot of this work has been done literally at the encampment, bringing um, Metro Dallas Homeless Alliance and a lot of the partners will bring tables and computers and laptops where we're able to do applications, we're able to do Zoom uh, voucher briefings and even electronic voucher issuances. Um, and in addition to that, uh, once the COC procures or tries to get a number of units that are ready, um, even before a voucher holder maybe or an emergency housing voucher holder may be identified, we've even gone to do pre-inspections so that units are, are ready to go immediately once folks are deemed eligible so that it's not the other way around and the waiting process happens. So as you can see on the screen, we've expedited everything from the electronic uh, pre-application all the way to the move-in process. Um, and I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about post-move services. That's um, something that we rely on Metro Dallas Homeless Alliance along with the continuum of care and the partnering organizations to help along with that but we have been using heavily the service fees and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. So uh, we've actually launched an artificial intelligence software called Bob.ai, you can Google it, you can watch videos, um, but essentially what we've done is we have expedited the, the request for tenancy approval process, the RAFTA process, those PHAs out there know what I'm referring to um, in regard to getting families leased up and having to go through to fill out all the bureaucratic paperwork, which is a lot of times something that's a barrier to landlords not wanting to have to take the paperwork, fill it out, bring it to the housing authority. So now everything is fully electronic and online. Um, so once a family receives a voucher, they can actually log in, create a username and password. All of our landlords that have units that are available uh, are actually listed in the app and it, part, it will actually um, tie them to a landlord with a unit that's affordable. And so that's, again, a game changer with the emergency housing vouchers in that, um, whereas it is important that we have housing navigators out there looking for new units, but we also have another uh, form of technology that's matching families up or individuals up, homeless individuals with units that are currently available um, in, in which they can afford. Because as we know, there's the rent comparability test, but what comes first is affordability. And that's a huge challenge for our homeless individuals and families in that there may be units, but they may not be affordable based on the payment standard, even if it is at 120%. Here in Dallas, we are experiencing anywhere between 14 and 17% increases um, with rents. That's new rents and even rental increases. So that's a huge challenge for someone that doesn't need housing assistance, much less someone who is under a bridge in an encampment and needs a lot of supportive services. So this technology also helps with partnering individuals up with units that are available with landlords that are also working with us. And you can go to the next slide. So once a unit's located, rather that be in the app or the housing navigator uh, through the, our continuum of care that's out securing units, 
we will, like, as I mentioned earlier, we will, we will um, pre-inspect units. This really requires a very close um, coordination and a lot of flexibility, I'd say, on the housing authority's part, because I think going into it, I've been doing this for over 15 years and kind of sometimes want to be by the book. Well, I am always by the book, so I don't want to as, as, say as if I'm not. Um, but as far as the process, it's like, you know, well, this has to happen and this has to happen. Realistically, a lot of the processes can happen sim simultaneously, but when you don't have the technology and you're doing it manually, it's hard to manage to do simultaneous processes. But when you use technology, it really allows you the flexibility to significantly increase um, helping someone to find housing and to get the unit inspected and get moved in almost immediately. So what you see on the screen is an app that the families have access to for free, our landlords have access to for free. Um, they can list units for on the landlord side, list units, and also fill out the request for tenancy approval. Um, and yes, this is available for anyone, any housing authority that wants to procure it. This is available for everyone. We honestly are hoping, this is for real my shameless plug, we are hoping that this level of technology can change the face of the voucher program across the country, not just in Dallas. We are hoping that what we are doing with Metro Dallas Homeless Alliance um, is something that's a game changer. And whereas we may, may not be at 80 and 90% utilized with our EHVs. The question is, do you go based on quality or quantity? And it's really important that we really focus on, um, on those that are most in need. And so again, in order to do that, you have to focus on technology because in the private market, um, the landlords that are accepting the vouchers, whether it be EHVs or the regular housing choice voucher program, they need to see efficiency. They need, they need to see that it's easy for them to use, um, to be incentivized to work with the voucher program as a whole here in Dallas and anywhere across the country. And so on the screen, you could see some of the incentive, uh, the service fees that we have um, utilized. All of the service fees we are basically using for incentivizing landlords. So a landlord incentive bonus, um, application fees, utility deposits, damage mitigation fees. And the way that works is, so that it's faster, Metro Dallas Homeless Alliance will front load those dollars. They will provide us with the doc documentation and then we do the reimbursement so that the money can get out, out the door faster while they're out securing units and being able to help pay the, the application fees and security deposits when they're on the field, uh, out in the field on the ground trying to secure these units uh, really quickly. Next slide. And I'm trying to hurry because um, I know that we don't have a whole lot of time. So, um, Julie, if we want to kind of tag team this one, I guess what I'll just say is, you know, there's a lot of key ingredients and obstacles, and I, I say this a lot, and I mean it, and I think we, it's, it's a good reminder. If this was easy, it would be done already, and it's not, but it takes everyone like you on the call to, to love what we do, to be passionate, to know that this is worth fighting for, um, and putting in the work, whatever, whatever is needed to solve the problem. And a lot of times it feels like once we solve the problem, there's, you know, there's much more that comes in front of us. Um, but that's the world of, of working with uh, the homeless population. And I think that there's a lot of inequities that I, I think can be, um, can really be solved with funding, partnership, um, and just the support of our entire community. So Jolie, I'll let you kind of wrap us up too with the, this takeaway. Yeah, Brooke, you, you nailed it. Thank you for that. Thank you for the partnership. So as you see on the screen, there's there's the ingredients and obstacles to overcome. They are not insurmountable, but it is a work every day uh, just to be sure that our priorities are aligned across um, the various organizations and entities that are working in this space. The competition, as we've seen in the chat, in the housing market and with landlords. I won't, I won't belabor the point of all of the other items as you can see in the, in the slide deck will be shared with everyone. But, but thank you all for the opportunity to come in and chat a little bit about the tremendous work happening here in Dallas and Collin County. Thanks so much uh, to both of you. It's a really great presentation. Good to hear about the incredible work you're doing there. Just quickly, we are recording this, so people, that was a question in the chat, so you will have access to that. And if you have questions, please put your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat so that we can get a chance to potentially get the answers to them. And finally, um, I want to turn it over now to my good friend Vicki Millette from Miami-Dade County. Vicki, you there? Yes, thank you, Nan, and thank you, Sharon. I appreciate the opportunity to present. I'm really blown away by everything Dallas is doing. 
I also want to say before I even start my first slide, we've had tremendous HUD technical assistance from the beginning of the pan pandemic until today and so many different areas and it's been just tremendous. So thank you, big thank you to HUD. Um, we knew we had a senior problem way before, next slide, way before the pandemic. We were looking at our numbers and the AHAR, as you can see here, and we saw that our 62 plus numbers were climbing, climbing, climbing. Obviously, then we switched over to the next slide, LSA, and we've seen some flattening of the 55 plus crowd, but we continue to see potential upticks in the 65 plus crowd. So we knew we had a senior issue even before the pandemic, and this was an area we were somewhat focused on. Next slide. So then the pandemic hits, and like so many continuums, we were working to stand up emergency facilities. We did activate three entire hotels, one a small boutique hotel. We converted a, a, a vacant transitional housing program into a COVID and isolation site. And we were able to partner with a assisted living facility operator. She had just received her license. She was ready to open her building. COVID hit and she knew she wasn't gonna get referrals the way she needed. So she reached out to us. We found one another and we said, let's partner, let's see what we can do with people experiencing homelessness. And as you know, we had lots of 65 plusers on the street and we have lots of 65 plusers in our congregate shelters. So we immediately worked to extract those individuals from the shelters and put them at a more uh, conducive site to be able to fend off COVID outbreaks. And we had an entire isolation wing and then we had other protocols put into place. So. In total with COVID, we had 6,600 plus intakes. At Mia Casa, which is in Spanish, my house, um, we had about 297 65 plusers who we've served since April of 2020. Um, our guests range from the ages today between the ages of 65 and 93. We have a 92 person census as of today. And it's been a tremendous environment to engage seniors who we knew and previously had rejected congregate living facilities or we weren't able to engage in a way that they were willing to take the next step. It's been really great. And we've also, I'm proud to say, have protected people. We have had almost no COVID cases in this entire time and we have had no deaths. So it's really been an amazing experience to work with this operator to protect people experiencing homelessness. We've also had 70% of people who've gone to this location who have exited to permanent destination. So in our minds, this is a permanent destination. This is bridge permanent housing for us, even though we're technically calling it a quarantine and isolation site. Seniors are not asked to go or leave or move on. And we try to move them on to other permanent housing throughout the continuum, including EHV vouchers, which I'll talk about in a bit. Next slide. So really a collaborative effort and truly, truly, I mean that. Um, we partnered with a group by the name of Unlimited Senior Solutions who really previously had only done ALF work. This is her first foray into working with people experiencing homelessness in a larger way. Um, we had a great partnership with the Florida Department of Health in Miami-Dade administering COVID tests and vaccines at our site. We partnered like we'd never had before with Camilla's Health Concern. This is the Healthcare for the Homeless Agency Federally Qualified Health Center. We'd always been connected with them, but they have really been hands-on as we've been working with these seniors and they've been able to provide uh, medication management and help with needs um, beyond you know, what we're equipped to provide. Um, Chapman Partnership, that is our private sector partner. They do elsewhere 800 beds of emergency shelter for us, but they have provided all of the meals at Mia Casa since its inception and the case management. It also helps that they are our contracted provider handling the emergency housing vouchers. And I'll talk about our prioritization in a minute. And we've also forged a closer relationship with our area agency on aging, the Alliance for Aging. So the Alliance combined with Unlimited Senior Solutions have really been key in helping us move seniors who require a higher level of care onto assisted living or nursing home care or connecting them with long-term care benefits. Um, there's just a level of expertise there that we didn't have that we're now um, able to um, have and move into various programs. Um, I also wanna say typically ALFs are much more expensive 
Um, this obviously this ALF operator is working with us. We're paying her monthly to operate this facility. And they've really been great at taking sort of a higher level of client that might not have met threshold to go into some of our congregate living facilities. Maybe they need to, we've even had cases where the clients need to be bathed. And because she had worked in assisted living facilities, she was willing to take a chance on these clients knowing that there was a path to an assisted living facility or the next step of care. Um, so how did we prioritize? Um, I'm gonna to get to that in a minute, but also we had, you know, the comprehensive services for the high risk seniors. And I should also mention we had safety. Um, some seniors were afraid. They would rather feel more comfortable being on the street than to enter one of our congregate living facilities. So having this non-congregate ALF-like facility, it's 67 rooms, 92 people. So we do have some um, pairs, um, but for the most part, they just felt a sense of safety. And um, when you put all 65 plusters together, there's just a different sense than any other congregate or non-congregate facility that we've had. Um, how are we going to move forward? So we're trying to now acquire this property to make it a permanent part of the COC's portfolio. We haven't owned a lot of properties in the past, but um, we worked with our public housing agency, our largest public housing agency to get $5 million set aside in home dollars. We got a special appropriation in the fiscal year 22 legis legislative session of 1.75 million um, for acquisition of properties, not just this property, but others as well. We partnered with our local foundation to start an ending homelessness fund. And that has been able to generate money. And around the holidays, we did an entire campaign to try to bring on new donors. And then obviously we are setting aside money from our local um, food and beverage tax, which is a dedicated tax for homelessness that we've had for many, many years to operate this facility. Um, we also have Camilla's Health Concern, who is our federally qualified health center, healthcare for the homeless provider, who is about to enter into a qualitative and quantitative study of seniors and homelessness. And they've also shared with us so many anecdotes of people who have you know, previously experienced chronic homelessness come to this facility or agreed to come to this facility and become stabilized, not only you know, mentally, but their healthcare issues and their um, complex needs are sort of under control. Um, the gentleman you see in the top left-hand corner um, he had been on the street for more than 10 years. He had a combination of a substance use disorder. He had some dementia. He had some anemia. Just, I want to credit the outreach team's persistent outreach got him in. And you would never know the history he had on the street. He's doing terrific at this Mia Casa facility. So prioritization, we worked a lot with HUD technical assistance to reorient our prioritization. We updated our coordinated entry policies. We up, updated our rapid rehousing. Um, policy, our orders of priority, as well as our homeless prevention policy. Um, initially, we had two tiers, and our tier one was senior 65 plus and people with those underlying health conditions that made them most at risk for a serious illness or death from COVID. And then we had tier two, was which under unsheltered homelessness, chronic homelessness, um, high system utilizers, unaccompanied youth and victims. Uh, while we were doing the seniors, we were just hearing a lot of pushback that, you know, we had a lot of chronically homeless there that might not have been 65. So we opened the door further so we could um, sort of juggle those priorities. Um, we also treated all of our, at that time, we didn't have any EHV vouchers. So we treated our entire system um, across, we had the ESG resources, everybody was referred to RAPID. We started with RAPID and we've used RAPID to a bridge to EHV or PSH or other housing resources made available. We also used our ESG resources to um, target encampments, particularly substance users and encampments. So we used our ESG to create three new specialized outreach teams. Uh, we tried to prioritize as much of the EHV as possible for RAPID rehousing. We also had a portion set aside for prevention, and that's where the equity work, I think, really came in. We could have, and we did, get the waivers from HUD that could allow us to serve up to 58% AMI, but we really tried to continue to focus on those 30% and below people with previous experience of homelessness and those with prior evictions. That was our way of sort of getting at the equity work. Uh, we continue to work with the participating jurisdictions to draw down HUD dollars and really set those preferences. I know HUD has the policy brief now that we're sharing with all of them. 
Um, so not just home for this one senior project, but home for many services and properties that we are seeking to acquire. So we've been in touch with five of our participating jurisdictions. We've sent letters, we've had meetings, we've told them how to create the preference and, how, and what we'd like the preference to look like. And that has really been helpful. We've also done a lot of work with the EHV. We have four public housing authorities here in Miami-Dade County. It's Miami-Dade, Hialeah, Miami Beach, and Homestead. Next slide. Um, some of these numbers are a little bit off and improved, I'm happy to say. So our Miami-Dade, which is our largest um, PHA, we're beyond 54% lease up at this point. Um, Hialeah, I just got an update from today. We're at 53%, but lots of people still like, um, they've turned the paperwork in, they've identified the housing, we're just finishing off the process. And we're working to employ as many of the incentives as we can across the board. Each PHA is a little bit different. The MOUs we have with them look a little bit different. Um, Hialeah is working with some of the incentives we recommended to, um, and they're administering some of the um, startup fees from within their program. They're using the service fees themselves. We have one entity doing the housing for everyone across the board, but they're working with other providers and other programs. Uh, we increased some FMRs with Miami-Dade back in May, so that was really good. We've also moved our PSH to 120% FMR. Um, we you know, are mindful of those budgets and how much we can do with those budgets, but we wanted to get a leg up on our PSH and go to a higher payment standard. I've never seen the housing market in Miami-Dade as tight it is as today. And then we've employed volunteer groups to sort of reach out to the landlords. We have the whole database of landlords available in Section 8, and we're calling them down in a very rudimentary way to see what's out there. So this is our EHV picture. We've made 662 referrals thus far. We have 397 of those housed and 85 with units identified. We're still out there pounding the pavement looking for available units. I also want to put a push in. Um, our mayor, uh, Miami-Dade County Mayor Daniela Levine Cava, has also embraced the House America Initiative, and that has two goals. One of which is how many new units of permanent housing can you get into the development pipeline for people experiencing homelessness? And we've set our goals on that, and we've also um, set a goal for how many people we're going to rehouse during the pandemic. So that's really been helpful. And my only advice is never stop. Um, continue, last slide, beat down the doors, know your PHAs, know your participating jurisdictions, know your um, affordable housing developers, understand their portfolios, understand the politics around each and every one of those uh, PJs and PHAs, know their needs and challenges, and you, you use your networks to make introductions. I can remember it was a HUD field office, former HUD field office director who first introduced us to the Hialeah Housing Authority. And, that introduction changed everything. Aside from the EHV, we have 100 vouchers with them and every day we're partnering with them to add more vouchers to the pipeline. We've just partnered with them on mainstream previously and now we've applied for more mainstream. So it's really been instrumental. Um, be proactive, don't wait for the PJs and the PHAs to call you. You've got to call them because they're not exactly banging down the door. Um, lobby for those preferences and set-asides whenever possible. When you see a solicitation come out, hey, you're willing to put in the sweat equity and partner with them on answering questions, providing the data that's gonna make that application stronger. Um, every one of these engagements typically has to have an MOU. As a COC, we like to take the lead on shaping those MOUs. And then don't be shy about going back for more. You know, Prove yourself, as I say, on the EHVs, show that you can get um, extremely low income households who are experiencing homelessness leased up and then go back for more and say, look, we had a success. We leased up at the rate. We got the job done. Um, you know, these vouchers mean the world to us or these resources that help us acquire properties mean the world to us. Um, when the, we're working with the PHAs or the tax credit set asides, we like to make sure we make timely referrals. Landlords, for landlords especially, time is money. We don't want them to be sitting on vacant units waiting for us to fill out paperwork. Um, we like to share information, the good and the bad. So just today we had a call with one of our housing authorities and they said some of the inspections as we were bridging people from rapid to EHV were failing and said, 
get us some actionable information. Why are the inspections failing? So we can dig deeper and try to knock out whatever the issue is and make sure our providers are aware when you're moving people in under a habitability standard, keep an eye out for this in the event that they bridge because we wanna make sure we can meet that HQS standard. Uh, reaffirm what you have to offer, what you bring to the table. So the PJ is HA you're just asking for stuff that you have something to bring to the table and then always be responsive when troubleshoot. You know, don't let calls and emails sit and wait. Um, act like, you know, if you don't answer this uh, problem or address this issue, um, act like you'll never see another voucher again. That's how we try to behave. So it's a little crazy, um, but that's my presentation. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Vicki. Um, thanks to everybody. Oh, Nan, I might've jumped in uh, on you. Sorry about that. Oh, great. Um, we're gonna move to uh, Q and A. Um, there have been great questions that have come in. So I'm gonna ask all the panelists to um, come off video and, and join the, the Q and A. Um, and I'm gonna kick off the first question uh, actually to, to Dallas, to Julian Brooke. Um, first question is, can you talk to us a little bit about how you're funding the case management that's attached to the EHVs? Um, I think Sarah's on there, but there was a model built out around case management, salaries, um, even taking into account kind of supervision of those case managers that through the RFP process for those service providers, then they're able to um, have access to that, that, that stream of funding. Is that kind of what the question, is that what they were, is that what they were asking about? Yeah, basically funding questions. And I forgot Sarah's in the chat too, so. And the only thing that I'll add regarding the EHVs is that um, considering that the COC is helping with mobility assistance and helping in secure units, then once a unit's secured, then there's a fee that goes along with that as well for mobility, the, the search assistance. Okay, great. Uh, Brooke, I'm going to uh, stay with you. So the, the second question is, can you explain a bit more about the pre-inspection and electronic voucher issue process? Um, you know, maybe things that are replicable to other communities. We had a question, one of the uh, attendees said that in the PHA in their jurisdiction is extremely slow to answer and return calls or to even process the RTFAs. Um, and this leaves most landlords in the area reluctant to participate with vouchers through the PHA. So I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I'll, that's kind of a loaded question. So I'll start with the pre the pre inspections first. And so we haven't really done that. We haven't used that process uh, before. We did that as a way of being flexible um, in coordination with our COC to ensure that if they have um, ten units that they've secured, that we can go out and pre inspect. And so what I do is we'll send out um, either virtually or in person. We'll send out inspectors to go and inspect those units, ensure that everything passes, um, get that completed in our, in our system and our platform, which is Yardi. And then once the family is deemed eligible and ready to move in, well, that process is already done um, because move-in can't happen and PHAs are not allowed to submit payment until there is a past HQS inspection. And so we did that really to be a little bit more flexible to um, improve the move-in process. In regard to um, the briefings, you know, COVID, whenever they, whenever HUD released all the flexibilities, there, there were a lot of benefits that came along with PHAs being able to do virtual uh, voucher briefings. And so we've continued to do that. HUD has allowed housing authorities to continue to, to use that as well. So we're doing the virtual briefings. In fact, our, our briefing is on our website. Anyone can go and visit. It's a two-part video. And so we direct our, the individuals and families to watch the video and confirm. We will also be putting that into a system where we could see if they've actually watched the video to confirm. And then once that happens, then we will send out the voucher electronically versus having someone walk in in person to sign um, and go over that. So that's something that with the COC, we've been able to do virtually. So whereas my staff are here in the building, our administrative building, case managers are out in the field at the encampments with the computers and we could do that all together versus having to relocate and coordinate because you know it's really hard with especially in an encampment it's hard to find you know everyone that they've secured housing for so it's easier for that to be just like a one-stop shop so we try to pre-inspect 
do the, the virtual briefing, issue the voucher. And then at that point, really think what really with Metro Dallas Homeless Alliance, it's, it's, to me, it's transformative. They would, once everything is completed, they literally will drive folks over to the property and they all sign the leases and contracts and we make sure that the HAP is ready and they're coordinating with the housing authority to have the con someone on, you know, ready, ready to take that call. I think that's an important thing, part of that question, and I'm sorry, I can be a bit long winded, but when working with a PHA, you have to have a couple of contact people. If you're just leaving it to a caseworker that's assigned with larger housing authorities, that's really challenging. And so I would recommend for COCs or service providers really do a really good job of trying to get to know and, and get a good relationship with a couple of PHA um, staff members so that whenever you call, when you email, when you message, they're there and ready for to, to initiate whatever process is needed. Thanks, Brooke. No, that's, that, was, that, was, that was great. Um, I think the more detail, the better for folks thinking about how to really replicate it um, and how to make it happen in our communities. I just want to follow up on uh, some of the just clarity on, Julie, what you said. So just to, to clarify, the source of funding for the case management of the EHVs is home dollars and treasury funds. That's what's paying for case management. Is that Correct. Okay. Correct. Great. Excellent. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, next question is for Vicki. Um, Vicki, can you provide some information or just a little bit more detail about the kinds of support you're now able to provide to older adults due to these partnerships you've crafted and what service gaps you, you all are still finding exist? Sure. I think having the healthcare for the homeless provider visit regularly, that's been really essential. They can, you know, check on up on all of their health needs because these individuals often have multiple complex issues. Um, I think the, the gap that still exists, although we're tackling it a little bit better, is some clients just seem to need a higher level of care. They cannot um, uh continue to do their activities of daily living. And as you can expect, these individuals are 65 plus. That's where the Area Agency on Aging comes in and we have a really strong partnership with them. Um, I had a few vignettes here on just some of the people that we were able to assist and, and some of the, um, let me just grab this, um, some of the folks. So, 71 year old Hispanic male, history of malignant carcinoma squamous cell. He met at one of our other quarantine and isolation sites. Later, we sent him to Red Roof and he's doing great now. He had surgery, he's recovering from treatments, he's still in Mia Casa and moving forward with a, a, a more a different housing plans. But lots of, you know, alcohol abuse, anemia, dementia, bipolar disorder. Um, people who've been suicidal, um, people with diabetes, people with neuropathy. I mean, the, the level of complex medical needs is, is being met because we have senior specialized case managers and, and, and um, social workers and healthcare professionals engaging regularly. That's great, thank you for that. Um, one of the things I want to circle back, I, I know that that, um, that Julie and Brooke and, and Vicki, you all talked about just the, the landlord, um, just the difficulty in engaging landlords um, in, in taking vouchers and the incentives and the fees. But it is definitely something that keeps coming up in the, in, kept coming up in the chat. So just wondering if you, like a, a couple um, just reiterating, maybe re-expressing um, re again, just what are those um, key elements of building those relationships and the repertoire with landlords to, to have them um, rent, uh, lease up the, the vouchers? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, a couple of things. We are, we are an, a very direct, what will get you to yes? Can we start there? Can we start the conversation with what, with what will get you to yes? Is it a previous burn that you've had with working with individuals with vouchers? Well, we can mitigate that by, you know, having one point of contact here within our organization, right? Like really trying to remove all of the barriers that we hear, but it takes some listening, it takes time, it takes relationship building. Um, 
And the other part of the work that we're doing that I'll lift up is it's in its infancy, its preliminary phases, is utilizing um, a third party um, organization that does tremendous like research and analytics. They did it around eviction here locally. And they're gonna lean in in that space to help us do just a little bit of research around where are vouchers being accepted? Who previously accepted the vouchers that are no longer accepted? Like, also getting to that level of really research data-based information that can help us make decisions, that can help us do advocate, very targeted advocacy work as well. Um, but leveraging that community partner in that in that way is, is one of the avenues that we're using. Great, thanks. Thanks, Julie. Our, ours is different than what will get you to yes. Ours is more, how can we be your uh, agency of choice versus the 15 other renters, some of whom have no government subsidy in hand, who are trying to pound down the door of that one unit. So we have, you know, lines of people trying to get one unit. How can we best advocate for the clients? So it is those, you know, going higher on the FMR. It is, you know, explaining that we have the support services, explaining that this is, you know, government backed money. It's a sure thing. Um, I really don't have landlords who don't want to work with vouchers in a large way. I just am trying to see how we can lift up our clients before everyone else who's housing strained or trying to secure a unit in the community. And, and I'll just add one, just one small piece. What's interesting about what happened with COVID is we've actually, in Dallas, while we could do a better job with educating or I'll, I'll say re-educating our landlord community about how the voucher program works, especially because what the efficiencies that we've created over the last three years are really much different. So if they had a previous bad experience, we want them to give us another chance. And I think what's important is acknowledging that. Um, in my experience, instead of trying to shy away from the bad, um, the bad criticism or the bad things that have come along with the voucher program. I think it's acknowledging it um, and owning that, you know, there is a lot of bureaucratic processes. We hear you and we have done a lot to improve that um, alongside with our sponsoring ag agency HUD and a lot of our community organizations. And we have all their support um, now more than ever, especially in the homeless, in the homeless population. And the last thing is what I was going to say, the interesting thing about COVID and the landlord, um, them it being more accepting is that when COVID happened and there was an eviction moratorium, there was nothing that landlords could do if someone wasn't paying their rent. Well, if there was a voucher holder in that unit and they lost their income, well, that voucher participant was going to have an adjustment and the housing authority was going to be paying more, whereas the family was paying less. And that wasn't a security that they had um, with someone that was not a voucher holder. And so I think that opened the eyes for a lot of the landlord community in that um, there is some security in a regular HAP payment that comes the first of every month. Thanks, Brooke. Thank, thank, you, thank you all for, for that insight. Chad, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, I just wanted to add. So we, we understand landlord engagement is an issue uh, across the voucher program. We actually have done quite a bit on it. I, I dropped it in the chat here with a bunch of resources that we've been putting together to help housing authorities. And a lot of times it's just a matter of even just dispelling myths, right, that some landlords have. And so uh, I would encourage everyone to check that out. I, we also held a webinar on this topic. Uh, we've held a number of them, but there was one recently where we really reviewed all the resources. So I'll drop that in the chat for anyone that's interested. And then, you know, uh, hopefully you'll see this, like we're working with our field offices uh, over the next few months to really try to do more landlord engagement and host uh, landlord symposiums to, again, uh, dispel some of the myths about the voucher program and, and hope to encourage more housing authorities to, uh, and, and landlords to participate. And if I could just say one thing regarding uh, something that we've been hearing really for the past two years around just fair market rents being too low, lagging data, those kinds of issues. Uh, PDNR, uh, Policy Development Research Office that sets the fair market rents. This year, they are looking to do things differently. And by that, I mean, they are looking to incorporate more private data as opposed to just using that ACS census data so that they can get FMRs that uh, help reduce that time lag in the data that they would be more up to date. So that'll be coming out in August of this year hopefully it would um, have a result of bumping up those FMRs for next year. 
Danielle, before you get go off video uh, and Chad, just um, as we, we wrap up, you know, would would HUD would HUD communicate to folks? I think what we've we learned is the 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 importance of of housing, you know, extremely uh, vulnerable individuals. Just um, you know that communicate to the to the field that you all know that um, it, it takes time um, that communities need time to get uh, their you know uh, households who have. Um, more vulnerability, it's going to take them a little bit of time to get them housed. So just maybe just talking to the field about your HUD's understanding of that reality. Absolutely. And we have been reiterating this at the office hours. We have been talking to OMB about this and talking to the Hill about this, that, you know, we, we do know and understand that this population, I mean, I gave you the 90 day statistic from issuance to lease up. And I thought that was fantastic. I was thinking it would be more 120, 180, and all of that is okay. Like we do understand that, you know, not only is it a challenging population, but the headwinds that we are facing in the voucher program right now, um, between whether it's a lack of supply or FMRs or landlords not wanting to take vouchers. I mean, this is really kind of an unprecedented time in the voucher program just kind of writ large. And then when you just take a look at this population as well, I mean, yes, we, uh, you, you're all doing such an amazing job um, here with the success of EHV and, you know, our communication to the Hill on this, you know, is constant. They are as actually, we're going next week to give them updates. Um, and so we are trying our best to communicate both vertically and horizontally and to our Hill partners and industry partners um, that message. Chad, anything to add there? No, I think that's exactly it, right? Like I know that there, uh, we, we know uh, th that so many communities are targeting people with the, the biggest needs and, and we would expect that that would take time and we've seen it. Yep. And I know there's a lot of urgency and we speak of the urgency around uh, utilizing EHVs, but we, we don't mean to say, don't use these as a way to, we understand there's urgency, but there's also, it takes time. And so I know that sometimes it's conflicting, but we understand it. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that message. I think uh, the, the field really appreciates that understanding. Um, so I'm just gonna wrap up Q and A. I wanna hand it over to Nan. Just, I think one of the takeaways that I've observed here is that uh, it's it's definitely um, you know leveraging multiple multiple funding sources and partnerships uh, in order to get people what they need is one of the big takeaways here. So thanks everyone for joining us and Nan, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank thank you, uh, Christy, and thanks so much to all of you, uh, obviously for be joining us here on the webinar, but but much more importantly for for what you're doing. We still have significant funds in uh, many of the communities that can be used to address both the highest need people and uh, racial and other disparities in our system. Uh, for example, there's uh, the $350 billion of state and local fiscal recovery funds, um, much of which is still in play. And to date, more than 3 billion of that uh, money has been used to address homelessness, including in California that used almost 2 billion for housing for people who were experiencing homelessness. Nashville's going to use 40 million for outreach, shelter, and so forth. Austin is using 95 million for services. Madison, Wisconsin, using the funds to get people into housing. So there's still a lot of money out there to tap, and, and many others. In addition, the home CV funds were brought up, emergency rental assistance funds, and much more. We really do need to think uh, about all the resources we have at our disposal now and how to apply them to the highest need people so that we can reduce homelessness and racial disparities while we've got the wherewithal to do it. And this involves also, I think, thinking about how to strategically use your uh, COC funds. The NOFO process is coming up and uh, how to apply these other resources together with how to use the, the, the COC funds together with all of these other funds uh, to really make a dent in homelessness. It's a lot. And we're listening to everybody talk today to see how much effort it takes to make it happen. But we certainly owe it to our unsheltered, our older adult, our BIPOC neighbors to seize this once in a lifetime opportunity to make a significant dent in homelessness. Uh, I wanna thank all of you for joining us at this session. 
Thank you so much to the wonderful and insightful speakers who've helped us wade through some of the difficulties and challenges and successes of seizing this incredible moment. And thanks also to Christy and to Sharon and all the folks on the Alliance team who put this uh, webinar together. We look forward to the next one. Thank you, everyone.